will do my best to uh, hopefully not go so quickly. So we're going to start this morning with uh, one of my favorite talks. All right, so we're gonna, um, gonna start by telling you about Smokey. And Smokey was, belonged to my head oncology nurse when I was at a practice just north of New York City. Smokey was a beautiful white pity, as you can see, and he was Amanda's once in a lifetime dog. Do you guys know that phrase? <laughs> yeah, so you're all nodding your heads, which is great. So she um, was originally from San Diego, and she rescued him from a shelter, but she will tell you that he absolutely rescued her. And these are some of her early pictures from the shores of San Diego, like I said, in California. And he's the inspiration for this program. Smokey had a ton of medical problems. Um, actually, my husband, who's an internist, took care of Smokey. He managed his Addison's disease. He had a heart murmur. He had some kidney disease. He had some neurologic episodes, had had an MRI at our hospital. But luckily, he had no cancer. So my relationship with him was pretty fun. Um, Amanda brought him to work most days. On stressful days, she would bring him into the oncology room. And he was the kind of dog that your blood pressure just dropped when he came in. He had such a soul. And I would hug him on my most stressful days. And everybody in the hospital really loved Smokey. But unfortunately, if he's the inspiration for my story, he did develop cancer. When this happened, he was a 10-year-old male castrate, castrated pit bull. He had about 10 lipomas over the two years that Amanda had worked for me. So I'm an advocate for early cancer detection, or so I thought. So she would bring him in on different days, and I would stick a needle in his masses. I would make a smear. I see that it was fat. I would not submit it to the lab. I'd give him a cookie, and we would move on. She said, Dr. Sue, I found another mass. And I said, Amanda, let's just stick a needle in it. He's here all the time. We had one of these crazy long days at work. We were all getting hangry. Do you guys know that phrase? <laughs> yeah, so it's a common phrase in the US. And I said, oh, go get Smokey. Bring him in, we'll do the aspirin. She said, you know what? Don't worry about it. If we're all tired, it's late, I'll bring him back another day. And we waited. And I don't think that really changed the outcome of his tumor, but it showed how complacent we got with these lumps and bumps because he had so many benign tumors. So I finally did the aspirin, stuck a needle in it, and I got a little bit of blood. And I said, don't worry, Amanda, I just hit a skin bleeder. And I aspirated again. I stuck my needle in, I made some smears, and I could tell that it was a cellular sample. And I love Smokey. So I actually got tears in my eyes. So I look at Amanda, and she now has tears in her, his eye, in her eyes. So we submitted it to the lab. And in the second part, so this, let, this talk, um, there's going to be a little bit of overlap, and I'll try to separate them out because sometimes I do these talks independently. But in the next talk, the ABCs, we're going to go through cytology. But this is what we got for Smokey. Does anybody know what this one is? It's a sarcoma. It's a connective tissue cancer. And when I talk to clients about these tumors, I say, if you have to pick a malignant tumor for your dog, this in general is a good one. And again, we're going to go through the cytology in the next lecture. But these tend to have elongated spindeloid cells with wispy-like tails. And that's how I describe them to the owners. These tumors have like roots of the tree that extend from the tumor. So if you just cut out the mass, you just cut out the trunk of the tree, as I tell the owners, and leave the roots, these tumors grow back. That's why for these tumors, we need to get clean and wide margins. So we decided, because this tumor was about a seven centimeter mass, I don't even have a picture of his tumor before I took it off because I had no idea that it was going to inspire this program. But our surgeon decided that she wanted to do a CT scan to see how she would plan for her surgery. And we also got a pre-surgical biopsy. And it confirmed a low-grade soft tissue sarcoma. So again, these are good tumors. Why? They tend to have a low metastatic rate, about 10 to 15% for the low and intermediate grade soft tissue sarcomas but they require really big and clean and wide margins. And that's why finding them early is so important. So this is one of the first pictures that I have of Smokey. Um, and so what the surgeon did, his tumor was up on the left flank. She needed to take a flap of skin from the cranial thigh, move it up there. Remember, he's Addisonian. He has a heart murmur and a bunch of other conditions. So here he is in the hospital with his drain after surgery. So we were getting a little bit concerned about the edges of the flap here as they started to turn a little bit dark. 
He was a white pit bull. We saw every bruise in him, lots of crusting here, really hard area for healing because he was moving and just trying to keep him quiet as it went along. Some days she would bring him to work and some days she would text me these pictures from home. Obviously we're getting worried because this is opening up here and the flap is not looking healthy at all. So definitely that's when I got a little bit nervous and actually the surgeon got a little bit nervous as well. It did heal up great. We got back the biopsy report. We got clean and wide margins. It was a low grade soft tissue sarcoma. He had no metastasis on his chest x-rays. Chemotherapy was not recommended. It's a happy story, right? But it's not. I wondered to myself, how did I let this dog, who I see all the time, that I was aspirating all these lumps and bumps, get a tumor so big that required such a big surgery with such an involved healing process? And I thought to myself, what are we doing wrong? So what do the books say for when we should be aspirating lumps and bumps? That's the problem. <laughs> So either you know the answer you don't want to say, or the problem is there aren't good guidelines. I did an internship, I did a residency, and I was like, my God, what am I forgetting? There are not good guidelines. The current guidelines say if a mass is growing, changing in size or appearance, or irritating the patient. And as you'll see from a lot of the cases that we're all seeing in practice, those are not good guidelines. There are too many lumps and bumps are getting too big because we don't know when and how big we should aspirate them. And I thought to myself, we need to do better. Started with some emails with some of my oncology colleagues and I said, guys, there are too many lumps and bumps that are getting too big. We need better guidelines. So I call it see something, do something, why wait aspirate. And I'm really hoping that this will be the new standard of care for lumps and bumps for dogs and cats. Three things that I've learned and three take home messages about lumps and bumps. One, we need to be proactive with lumps and bumps. That means we need to stick needles in them and we have to have owners aware of these guidelines so they come to us ready to do aspirates. So be proactive with lumps and bumps. Second one is know what the mass is before you remove it. Because if it's benign, you can take it off with much smaller margins than if it's malignant. How are we gonna know what it is? Aspirate or biopsy, and we're gonna go through those. And then the final uh, take home message is make the first surgery the only surgery. The only way you can do that, they're all tied together, is if you know if it's benign or malignant before you go to surgery. Three things that I also learned about myself during this process. What I love, what I hate, and what I'm good at. For those of you who don't know me online, I do a bunch of stuff as Dr. Sue Cancer Vet. My husband's actually recording this, so we're live on Facebook, um, which we realized in the States there's not going to be many people up and watching, but they can catch the replay. So I'm on Facebook. That's my uh, main social media channel. A little bit of Twitter, uh, doing Instagram, doing lots of Insta stories. Um, on my trip, we were in Prague before we came to Norway. Loving the country, by the way. Um, and also YouTube blogs. And as we go through the next few days, I'll highlight some of the things that we're doing on YouTube. I do informational videos really trying to break down the myths and misconceptions for pet owners when you guys break that really horrible news to them that their pet has cancer. Years ago, my nurses taught me about hashtags. I was really confused that there was no spaces between the words, but this is my favorite one, kick cancers butt, live longer, live well, and that's really what our patients can do even during chemotherapy. Why wait aspirate and see something, do something, and you'll see these on a lot of my slides. Uh, a couple of years ago, I wrote the Dog Cancer Survival Guide, which is a, pet, uh, a book for pet owners as their pets are going through cancer. And not in this one, that's for the states, but I am gonna be giving out stuff. So I have caliper pens and calipers so you guys can measure lumps and bumps. And at the end of the talk tomorrow, when I'm wrapping up, I'll be giving away a pair of digital calipers. Um, and in the... Uh, the talk after the break, you'll see how to sign up for all of that because we can't do the texting here in Norway. That's only in the US and Canada. Okay, so what do I love? I love my family, my husband. We have two kids, Hudson and Kale, who are now 11 and 12. This is my Matilda. I'm pretty obsessed with black Labradors. Uh, she's nine um, and luckily has not had any cancer yet, but she has had two knees fixed. This is Raz. This was Carrie's cat as we were going through our residencies. This is Jeter. I'm a Yankee fan, so he's a famous New York baseball player. This is Penelope, our little puppy, who's now a year and a little bit of a terror, and she has some kidney disease that you're trying to figure out so we can <laughs> fix her. I also love being a cancer specialist, and a lot of people find this really odd because they think my job is depressing. They think treating dogs and cats with cancer is depressing, and this is what they think I do, right? I poison dogs, I make them sick. 
this is what I do for a living. And what I love about this picture is you can't tell who in the picture is getting chemotherapy. In this picture, it's Roxy on your left. She's owned by my regional medical director, Suzanne. And when she was diagnosed with cutaneous lymphoma, she said it's really important. Every summer, we go to the beaches of South Carolina, and I want Roxy to have a good quality of life. I said 80% of dogs and cats handle chemo well. And here is Roxy on the beach in the middle of her chemotherapy. About five years later, Calvin, the dog on your right, was diagnosed with multicentric lymphoma. He had three annual trips down to South Carolina during his chemotherapy. Here he is, a 14-year-old dog, doing pretty well, um, enjoying life. What do I hate? I hate when veterinarians, including myself, say, keep an eye on it. It doesn't look like cancer. It doesn't feel like cancer. And these are all cases that I've seen in the clinic, and unfortunately, I'm guessing that you guys have seen dogs like it as well. We'll talk about Joey either in this lecture or the next lecture, depending on timing. This is a dog with a low-grade mast cell tumor, right? You can't do surgery on this anymore. This one actually belonged to my cousin's friend in New York City. The owner is a medical doctor, a human doctor. Um, these are teeth growing out of this benign mass in this dog. was cured with surgery. It was not until the dog couldn't hold the ball, uh, your guys' faces are funny, um, <laughs> that um, he brought the dog in. This is a cat with an inject a five centimeter injection site sarcoma. This owner was shocked, shocked that this cat's mask was too big for surgery. And this is um, a kitty Mario who had a big tumor right here on his lumbar sacral area that we'll talk about as well. And we're gonna talk about the pee. And again, this all comes from me telling you guys I messed up. Really big tumor in one of my favorite patients uh, you know, in Smokey, and how can we change this to make it better? So this is the gist of the program. If the mass is the size of a pea, and been there a month, if you see something, we need to do something, and the do something is the aspirin or the biopsy. This probably might not translate well, but in the US, <laughs> I ask, what is the size of a penny? So that's our cheapest coin. Anyone want to take a guess in centimeters? So it's, it's 1.9 centimeters, great. So I thought it was actually gonna be a centimeter just to show like how small a centimeter is. And it's really good when we're talking to pet owners if you can give them an everyday object because if you say a centimeter, they're gonna be like, what? Especially in the US because we still really use inches for uh, most measurements except for in veterinary medicine. So a P is about the size that we're looking for is about a centimeter. Um, an M&M, you guys have been, you know is a centimeter, and a Skittle, which is another sugar candy. Uh, those are all a centimeter as well. So I've spent the last year measuring lots of little objects. Okay, so see something, do something, why wait, aspirate. If the mass is the size of a pea and been there a month, I want pet owners to know about it and come to you, and then we need to do the aspirates. This is not unique to veterinary medicine. This is an ad for a human uh, breast cancer um, program in the US, so again, my lump was the size of a pea. So I like when things are translational between human and veterinary oncology. And the do something is the aspirin or biopsy, and we're gonna break that down as we go through. I've actually trademarked and copyrighted this program. Okay, so for the aspirates, um, I think we're gonna skip through this part, but this is what I always say that I'm good at. So my husband, um, you know, he's an internist, so he does cystoscopy, bronchoscopy, abdominal <laughs> ultrasounds, um, lots of procedures with lots of expensive equipment. But as we talk about aspirates, what I love about them is everybody has all the equipment that we need in our practice, right? Needles, syringes, microscope slides, everything that all of us have really cheap supplies. And microscopes are helpful as well. For this program, when I talk about it, I really emphasize, because how many people are comfortable doing in-house cytology? Just a few, actually probably about a third of the room, which is great. And then hopefully with the second lecture, when we go through the different cytology, you'll start to feel more comfortable with it. But for the program and the brochures that we've set up, so this is a joint program that I developed when I was with VCA, it is that the samples will go to the lab. I really like when cytologists look at the lab, but a lot of the times, for cost reasons, we don't, we're not always able to send everything to the lab. So if you can look at something yourself, that's great but I want pet owners to expect that the samples will go to the lab. Again, if you're comfortable looking at it and making a diagnosis, that's great, but I didn't want this program to fail because veterinarians were uncomfortable looking at cytology. And the reason I did the cytology lecture, which we'll be doing in the next hour, was to increase our comfort with it. So again, very low, low cost. This is a kitty litter tray in my uh, hospital that I used to work at. 
And my nurses have everything set up for me so I can do an aspirate on a moment's notice. So we'll have some needles, usually use a 20 gauge is my pr preferred one, but we also have some 22. We have our slides, some gauze. This is the top of the microscope box. This is how my nurses keep me from making a mess. <laughs> so we call this my mini sharps container. We have pencils to label it. I like a six cc syringe and then we just lay the slides out there. All right, so we're gonna come back on how to do the aspirates in the next lecture, which is the ABCs. And we are just going to hop through this because we will do this in the next lecture. Okay, so why do we need this program? So skin and uh, subcutaneous tumors are quite common. How common are they? It's thought to be about 25 to 45% of masses that are submitted to the lab. We know that cytology and histology are very important diagnostic tools. We know that we should know what it is before we go to surgery so we can better plan our surgery. But as I talked about and the lack of response, what are the current recommendations? There really aren't good recommendations. So that's what this program is gonna help. So we can prevent prolonged monitoring. We can prevent all these big tumors that we're all seeing in practice. Again, previously, there's been no guidelines for size and duration. So size of the pea and been there a month. Most skin and subcutaneous tumors can be cured with surgery alone if we find them when they're small. I'm gonna say it one more time. Most skin and subcutaneous tumors can be cured with surgery alone if we find them when they're small. So again, we need to find them when they're small, do aspirates, and we need pet owners to know about this program as well. And that's one of the reasons that I've taken to social media. So again, how common are they? They're pretty common. Like I said, about 25 to almost 45% of biopsies submitted are from the skin. Of course, that does not account for stuff that's not submitted to the lab, and that's statistic. Hey doc, what are the chances that that tumor is gonna be malignant? In general, it's estimated about 20 to 40% of skin masses and subcutaneous tumors are malignant. So that's pretty good odds, right? You can, you know, because lots of owners are gonna get scared if you say, I think this is cancer. There's a recent study out of England in cats that says up to 50% in cats are malignant. So what do we see in dogs and cats? The most common malignant ones are mast cell tumors. We'll be talking about that later after lunch. Squamous cell carcinomas, soft tissue sarcomas like smoky, and lymphoma like Roxy. Feline melanomas tend to be more malignant in cats than in dogs. So in dogs, they tend to be uh, benign, which is different than people. So what are the common benign tumors that we see in dogs? We see lipomas. So those are what Smokey had had mostly before we found his cancer. Sebaceous gland adenomas and hyperplasia. And in your notes, there are the different uh, percentages for these. Papillomas, the little wart-like lesions. The benign histiocytomas, a lot of these will regress in young dogs on their own. Melanoma in dogs tend to be more benign than malignant. And then basal cell tumors, much less common in dogs than cats. Though I actually just saw one, I had not seen it, it was actually malignant. So again, we'll see some variations. What do we see in cats? So this is a good time where we say cats are not small dogs. So many of the benign uh, cat tumor or dog tumors, we don't see that many in cats. So we don't see a lot of lipomas in cats. Uh, has anyone seen a lipoma in a cat recently? Yeah, so every once in a while I get a stray hand with those. Basal cell tumors are one of the more common benign tumors that we see in kitty cats. We can also see the adenomas. Mass cell tumors tend to be benign in cats, so again, different than dogs. And so again, the lipomas, I actually don't even usually stain these and submit them to the lab. Usually that's the one that I tell owners I can tell with the naked eye, and I try to keep costs down so we don't typically submit those to the lab. Um, we're gonna go through the cytology in the next one because we get to do cytology. So let's talk about some of the um, cases that we're seeing in practice. So this is Joey. This was a case that I saw in 2015. When I first met him, he was an 11-year-old uh, male castrated mixed breed dog. I think it was May of 2015. He had a mass had been present for two plus years. So he had been uh, gone to the vet many other times. The vet had noted it. He told the owners, well, the dog's having you know, difficulty getting up then we can do something about it. So the owners waited and Joey seemed pretty happy and healthy otherwise. Now he was having difficulty going up and down the stairs and even getting up from the laying down position and you'll see why. He had a 25 by 30 centimeter mass on his shoulder region. Other than arthritis, he was a pretty healthy dog. 
So this is Joey's tumor. He was one of the ones that I showed you in the front. So again, he has a tumor coming off his left shoulder. This is as we were shaving it up to go for surgery. About the size of a basketball. Just to put into reference, because 25 by 30 centimeters is so big, so that was about the closest everyday object that I could come up with. So the vet finally didn't ask for it after two years now that Joey's having difficulty looking at it. And again, we're gonna go through this in the next lecture, but just like Smokey, he had a sarcoma. So again, these are the ones with very elongated, wispy tails. Again, to help us think about the biologic behavior with these root-like tentacles that project from the tumor. So we took radiographs, he had a malignant tumor. I always recommend three view chest radiographs before they go to surgery. I told you for Smokey, in general, these have a very low metastatic rate. I see that you see them. So he had two nodules uh, noted on his chest radiographs. So now I had to go in the room and tell the owner's dog had metastasis. Probably shouldn't go to surgery, right? So the owners took Joey home and they decided not to do surgery. And then they just watched and he was having so much difficulty and they decided to do the surgery, piloted. They knew it was just for comfort. They just wanted to get this honking tumor off of their dog so he could be more comfortable. So I'm taking pictures for the program as I was starting to collect different cases for it. And so we have a surgery resident in there and she's uh, taking pictures for me. They didn't need to do a flap. The surgeon was really quite happy with how the surgery was proceeding. They bring me the mass, I'm weighing it, I'm measuring it, I'm taking pictures with it. And then I hear a stack call to the OR. And I said, someone tell me Joey's out of the OR. And I see our criticalist, Kim Hemble, fly in there. And so they said, no, 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 Joey's still in the OR. So he developed a cardiac arrhythmia and he arrested. She did CPR, she got him back, but two minutes later he developed sinus tachycardia. They closed him up real quickly, they moved him to our intensive care unit, he became anemic, he had a coagulopathy, so his PT and PTT were prolonged, they gave him blood, they gave him fresh frozen plasma, but he de developed ventricular tachycardia and he died in the ICU. And guess who would have called their owners and tell the dog, you know, tell them your dog that had a good tumor, he's not coming home. So VVIP, and then he passed away. And so I had a lot of guilt about this case. And I really thought, you know, maybe we shouldn't have taken him, and why did he die? We submitted it to the lab. It was a grade two, so an intermediate grade hemangiopericytoma, which is another name uh, pathologists often call malignant nerve sheath tumors. So again, just these class of soft tissue sarcomas, they should have a good prognosis. Margins, clean lateral margins. She didn't get deep margins, not surprising. It's hard to get a tissue plane deep with a tumor that big. The tumor weighed 12 pounds. Joey was 92 pounds, so I'm sorry, I know you guys do everything in kilograms here, um, but it was 13% of his body weight. That's like an average 150 pound person carrying a pug or a tire on their shoulder every day. And I think it really just makes us think about the burden of these really large masses on these dogs when their uh, tumors stay on too long. So again, without this program where these masses are being monitored for too long, they're getting too big, surgery is often not gonna be enough. Even if Joey got to go home, it likely would have recurred probably usually around six months later for the soft tissue sarcomas. So again, with incomplete margins, you, we know that these tumors are more likely to recur. Soft tissue sarcomas are 10 times more likely to recur with incomplete margins. That often means radiation or metronomic chemotherapy, so costly treatments that require more visits to a specialist to prevent these tumors from coming back. Or masses that are too large to treat, like that cat that I showed you in the beginning of the, pro of the talk. And so in some of these cases, like Joey, curative intense surgery is no longer an option. And why is this happening? And again, it's not because we're to blame, it's because there haven't been good guidelines to this point. So no guidelines exist, and we're often saying keep an eye on it. And I'd like to introduce you to Hope the P. Isn't she cute with her little eyelashes? She really became quite cute when we put the eyelashes on. So Hope the P is our mascot. I want finding cancer to be hopeful. I want owners to know, again, most skin and subcutaneous tumors can be cured with surgery alone if we find them when they're small. So again, that's why we went with the size of the P, which is a centimeter. And I want owners to know about it, and I want owners to come into you, and you can do the aspirin because they're expecting you to do it. Okay, so this one goes to 11, right? Yeah, great. So I don't like to go, we're gonna do a good one, because I like to live, you know, make, it, make things a little bit happier. 
So this is Rufus. I saw him three months after we saw Joey. Told you I love black Labradors. He's a guiding eyes dog that failed, so he didn't make it through the program. Um, and so one of my friends works for Guiding Eyes, and she said I'm not allowed to say that in the Guiding Eyes um, group. They say they choose to be with their family. So Rufus chose to be with a family. He was a little bit distracted all the time. So he was eight years old when I first met him, and um, eight-year-old male castrated Labrador. He had a 2.1 centimeter mass in his proximal medial thigh. So his tail is over here, and his big block head is over here and he had this 2.1 centimeter mass in his inner thigh. Been present for about a year. Owner noticed that it started to get a little bit inflamed, a little bit ulcerated, and brought him to the veterinarian who did cytology, and it came back mast cell tumor. Uh, vet did not uh, submit it because he was comfortable making the call. He sent it over to me because he wanted us to talk to him about it, and also because it was in a complicated surgical area. He was worried about getting margins in that inner thigh area. And as I'm doing my exam, I found this little innocent looking white raised mass, kind of looked like a keratin cyst, one of those ones that you aspirate, they have that thick white stuff, but I aspirated it, 1.1 centimeter, same leg, mast cell tumor. Okay, we're gonna go through the cytology of the second letter, second, second lecture. So this is actually, you guys know you can take a smartphone and balance it on the, it's so cool, right? You can send pictures to my husband, look what I found today, no. Not smiling. He doesn't love cytology the way I do. But this is a mass cell tumor, pretty classic. Uh, we'll go through discrete round cell tumor, lots of the uh, of purplish metachromatic granules. And so now we have two mass cell tumors, right? So one of the things that I think is important when we look at mass cell tumors and in our in-house stain, when we use DiffQuick, sometimes it's really hard to see those classic purple uh, metachromatic granules. Sometimes when we're using, um, so at the lab they use bright skim soap, which is really easy to highlight a lot of them. As you saw in the one that I took of Rufus's, we could easily see the stain or the granules. But sometimes when we're using the in-house diff quick, it's going to be really hard to see. So don't be surprised if, you're, if you can't really see the granules that well and then you send it to the lab and they're describing it. It's just a reflection of the different stains that we're using. All right, so time for Rufus to go to surgery. So again, our 2.1 centimeter mass in the inner thigh. Um, and he, this is a medical oncologist description of surgery. <laughs> they shaved him, you can see the tumor marked up there. Um, again, we're gonna go through mast cell tumors later today. So you can see they're actually measuring, they're in the OR, they're nice and sterile, they're measuring to get their margins. They're cutting it out, they're closing it up, and they staple him up. <laughs> Everything was going great, so the surgeon did the uh, second site at the same time. You can see the little mass right there, getting clean and wide margins, their tissue plane deep, and then closing him back up. So two surgeries at the same time, um, everything went well. We got back our biopsies. Both were low-grade mast cell tumors. Again, we're gonna unpack this later uh, today. Clean and wide margins. We'll talk about reading our biopsy reports for the quantity of margins and both of them had a very low mitotic index. So these are positive prognostic factors for dogs with mast cell tumors. We did the mast cell tumor prognostic panel. Again, we'll talk about that after. He had low scores and CKIT mutation negative. So everything was great. So he had clean and wide margins, a low mitotic index, all of his prognostic factors were good. So even though he had two tumors, one centimeter and two centimeter on the same leg, he had a great prognosis. All right, so. Now let's go back to for the cat lovers in the room. Let's go to Mario. So he was a pretty young cat when I met him. He was only seven year old, uh, male castrated, domestic short hair. He had a mass that had been present for about a year. This one's a little bit more complicated when we look back at it. So it was noted a year ago, the local veterinarian did cytology and it came back suspicious for sarcoma. And a lot of these connective tissue cancers for the sarcoma cytology is not always definitive. So the vet did the right thing. Uh, a biopsy was re recommended on the report. The vet did a biopsy and it came back benign fiber cartilage. Everybody was happy, right? So they decided not to remove it since it was benign, but it grew. And that's where I think it's really important if you have something benign that we're still giving the owners guidelines about size and duration and even giving them calipers to help them measure it because the, t the tumor continued to grow, even though it was benign. And then a year later, we have this big mass on Mario's lumbar sacral area. He's an 11 kid kitty, so he was a big boy. 
It was an 11 centimeter firm mass. The sur this actually came in through our surgeon. She did a CT scan and a biopsy to figure out what it was. And it came back as a low grade chondrosarcoma at the level of L3, so the lumbar, um, uh, the lumbar spine to S1, but it was invading the uh, dorsal spinous processes. So she was worried that even if she did surgery to get margins, she could potentially, potentially paralyze the kidney. So surgery was not an option um, for this mass. So I was, uh, worked with our radiation oncologist. We had, at the time, a stereotactic radiation, very conforming, but even our radiation oncologist was confirmed that there was too much spine involved and that we wouldn't be able to spare enough of the spine. Chemotherapy is not gonna do a very good job for uh, chondrosarcoma, so I sent him to another facility for palliative radiation. And here was an owner that was blessed to have money, and she said, fix my cat. And I said, we, no, we don't have any more curative intent options. So this is one where I think, again, if you have something that's benign, that's getting big and it doesn't fit, right, then maybe you don't trust that biopsy. Maybe it's time to re-biopsy or revisit and help the owners figure that out. And then finally, we have Hunter. I always like to end on a happy note. Pretty young dog, three-year-old male castrated golden retriever. Uh, mom said she found about a penny-sized mass on him, and she was right, okay? We talked about the size, so it was about 1.6 by 1.8 centimeters. This is on the medial hock on the hind leg. So again, not very classic for mast cell tumors, right? Not that, you know, hairless pink raised mass. This one was hair, and as you guys know, they can look like anything. The local vet did cytology, came back mast cell tumor, and again, was really concerned about doing it on the distal leg and getting margins, and the owners wanted to know more information. So Hunter came to me for some staging. So we decided to do staging. We'll talk about this again, you know, which cases we should be doing this, but we decided to start with, um, I aspirated the draining lymph node, so the popliteal lymph node was reactive, so no evidence of metastatic mast cell tumor there, which was great. We did an abdominal ultrasound. Dr. Huter thought that the spleen looked a little bit mottled. We talked about with the owner, should we do aspirates? Should we figure out if this is metastatic? And we decided, let's do surgery first. Let's find out more about the grade of the tumor, the mitotic index, but let's keep that spleen in the back of our mind. So I went to surgery next, and uh, the surgeon took it off. We got back a low grade, a grade two, an intermediate grade mast cell tumor, clean and wide margins. So two centimeter mass, even on the distal leg. So again, that's why we went for a very small guidelines for these tumors. So clean and wide margins, low mitotic index, Things are looking good for Hunter, just like they were for Rufus. We did that mast cell tumor panel, and this is one of the cases where I think the mast cell tumor panel is really important because he did have that mutation, which is associated with a worse prognosis, and we did recommend chemo, and we did recommend that they go back and do an aspirate. Uh, Hunter was from a couple hours away and actually followed up with the local vet. But from a local therapy standpoint, from the mast cell tumor on the leg, because we found it when it was small, we knew what it was before we went to surgery. No additional local therapy. Didn't need a second surgery. Didn't need radiation because we knew what it was and we got clean and wide margins at the first time. Okay, so the purpose of this program is to provide pet owners and veterinarians with a standard of care. So when someone says to you, when should I aspirate a mass? Again, if it's been there a month and it's a centimeter, we, we know that we should be doing it. So it's gonna promote, oops, sorry, early cancer detection early diagnosis with the cytology and biopsy. We're gonna talk a little bit more about aspirates in the next talk. And again, early surgical intervention. And I really hope that we will raise cancer awareness in general by getting people thinking about cancer and knowing that it can be caught early and that our pets can have a really good prognosis and that we can see that you know, cancer um, patients can actually do well even during treatment. So to get this done, again, we have Hope the P is gonna remind us that treating cancer is hopeful. We have veterinarian sheets, and these are like the proceedings in your handouts that kind of go through the program and the different recommendations. It's also really important that owners, because if you have a pet owner that comes in and doesn't know what we're talking about, and they say you want to do an aspirate, they're just going to, tell, they're going to say, get it off, right? They're going to be scared that it's cancer. So it's really important. So the analogy that I use is we don't prescribe heartworm medication without running blood work, right? We, do you guys have heartworm in Okay. Ah. <laughs> Should have done my homework. Okay. So heartworm disease is very common in the United States, and we're not going to put our patients on heartworm preventative, which is a monthly medication without blood work. And that's the same analogy. When an owner comes in and you say there's a lump or bump, they say just take it out. You say no. We need to know what it was with, 
what it is with an aspirin or biopsy. So again, you know, it's really important that we educate owners that this step is important. So we have these pamphlets that VCA helped me did with Hope the P, and it's for pet owners to really describe the program. Um, and a lot of this information is on my website as well. So little calibers, these are the ones that I was hoping, but I just, um, I'm no longer with VCA, so now I just have my own ones. And so these are the ones that we'll be giving out uh, as the morning goes on. And so I want veterinarians to have these, and I want owners to have them as well. So these are the little Dr. Sue calipers. And this is me on Thanksgiving measuring my turkey. Um, if you go to my Instagram feed, you will see that I was measuring my meal in Prague as well. So my scallops were, were perfect size. Um, the other thing is skin maps, right? We need to have something in our medical record system to keep track of this, and I want pet owners to have this as well. So on my website, in the pet owner resource section, I have one for dogs and one for cats. So when I use these in the clinic, I will you know, mark them, put the date, the size, and I will keep a copy and send a copy home with the owners. So the owners have this on hand as well. And again, we can all keep track. And so again, pet owners can find this and veterinarians can use this in their practice as well if they choose. I also think it's really important that our entire team, the front office staff, the technicians, in my clinic, when I'm you know, finished talking to an owner, I leave and my nurses come in. And my nurses, the owners will say, should I do the aspirin? And my nurses are like, yes. Like they see the results, they see the diagnosis that we get, they see how much we can help. So it's really important that an entire veterinary hospital really knows about the program. I'm gonna guess you don't know what this is, because in the States, most people don't know either. So WIIFM, -I -I what's in it for me? And every, you're gonna be thinking that all for the next couple of days as you're in these talks. And so what, you know, why, why, do, why do we care about this program? What I love about this program is Dr. Google, is that Dr. Google here? Yeah, right. So Dr. Google can't do the aspirates. So my mom, who's very proud, loves the program, She'll still, every once in a while, take a picture of a mass in one of our labs and ask what it is. And I say, Mom, we have to go to the vet. We have to do an aspirate. So why I love this is it's really an opportunity for veterinarians to be proactive and for pet owners to have to bring their pets in. And that's important. But we have to do the aspirates. I've had messages on Twitter and different social media from uh, pet owners in Australia, the U.S., the U.K., and they say, I went to my vet and my vet won't do the aspirate. What do I do? And so I say, go back, you know, tell them about the program. And sometimes they'll message me back and say, my vet still won't do an aspirate. What do we tell them? Go to another vet, right? So there's no reason. So we need to be doing the aspirates. But this is good. This will increase visits. It allows us to increase good revenue. It allows us to provide quality medicine and really be proactive and make our clients happy. If our pets are having better outcome, they're going to bring more pets to us and they're going to keep coming back and they're going to recommend it. And we're also going to improve our pet's quality of life, which is why we're all here. So again, no one can look at any of these masses and know what it is, right? So this is a mast cell tumor in a patient named Applejack. It's a little hard to see here, but this is another mast cell tumor in a boxer and a stifle. This is Bruno. Uh, Bruno is a dog that had about seven or eight mast cell tumors over the years that I took care of him. He's now a three-legged dog because he had osteosarcoma and we did an amputation. He was in the middle of chemo, and I found another mouse on his back leg, his only back leg. I was like, oh, Bruno, you made another mast cell tumor. No, soft tissue sarcoma. That's what I call a hoarder. They just have to, <laughs> they have to have lots of different tumor types. Um, and so actually, once he got through chemo and was uh, tumor-free and no metastasis, the owners did go, we did go and do surgery on that. This is a lipoma, this is Rufus's little mast cell tumor, and this is a cat with an injection site sarcoma. So it just shows that we can't look at a mass, we can't tell what it is, we really need to be proactive. So know what the mass is before you remove it. If you don't know what it is, do not remove it. So again, don't debulk it, don't do an excisional biopsy, you wanna know what it is. So an excisional biopsy is when you take it off not knowing what it is, and then you submit it to the lab to find out. So we wanna either do an incisional biopsy, um, or do the aspirate, and we'll talk about that in the next talk. So again, do the aspirate or the pre-op biopsy. We wanna know what the mass is, and again, if it's benign, maybe you can put off the surgery till a dental or something like that. But if it's malignant, you know that you're gonna do big surgery, clean and wide margins. And there are stu multiple studies that show the first surgery is the best chance for cure. So again, we really wanna prevent having to go back and do additional surgery. So make the first surgery the only surgery, 
Remove it earlier when the mass is smaller so we get those clean and wide margins. And again, likely curative. That's great news for our pets. So hopefully no additional therapy will be needed, no radiation, no chemotherapy, and our pets can have a great prognosis. So these are some of my see something, do something survivors. Uh, this is uh, Alice, she had a high grade mast cell tumor. This was on her chemotherapy graduation day. We give them little bandanas. Uh, mom was going through chemo as well, so that was good. This is Bruno. He was actually pretty mean for many of the first years <laughs> um, that I took care of him, but he mellowed with age, kind of like me. Uh, this is a dog with a soft tissue sarcoma on the head that we were able to get clean margins. This mom found me online uh, because of the program and then brought her dog down for surgery. This cat is one of the meanest cats I know. It's Tiger, he just turned 21. Six years after his inject high grade injection site sarcoma. Rufus, uh, the dog with the two mast cell tumors a couple of years later, uh, my husband and I were at the same practice for a while, but then we were at different practice and he said, do you remember Rufus? And I said, remember Rufus? I talk about him all the time. He actually had gastric T-cell lymphoma two years later. Yeah, uncommon location for lymphoma in dogs and did not do well. Uh, this was my team when I was up in the Hudson Valley in New York, and as I say, I can't do it without my team. All right, so your three things that we started with, your three take-home messages, be proactive with lumps and bumps. So we have to find them, we have to help owners identify them. We need to know what the mass is before you remove it. So we're gonna do our aspirates or biopsies. We'll talk about that in the next talk. And again, make the first surgery the only surgery. This is all you need to know. That's it. Uh, there in, uh, if you go to today's veterinary practice, last summer uh, is an article about this and it has a breakdown of the different charts and the different statistics and things like that. So that's another good color resource. You can get that as well. And I want to thank Andy Lohr, who's a cytologist that trained me at the Animal Medical Center in New York City. He gives me most of the pictures and you guys are probably not going to guess that that's a heartworm if you don't see heartworm. <laughs> I guess it's too cold in Norway. <laughs> it's probably a good thing. Um, and then finally, this slide will come up multiple times throughout the, um, the two days that I am with you. I have a closed Facebook group, so I have my general Facebook page, which I would love for you guys to join. You can see I share cases, uh, graduations, talk about the different patients that we're treating, but this is a closed group for veterinary professionals only. And so I would love if you would join. Uh, people share cytology, they ask questions and things like that. So almost 3,000 members. Uh, so again, I'd be more than honored if you guys would join. I do need to be able to tell that you're a veterinarian from your profile. Otherwise, I have to Facebook stalk you and it just takes a lot of time. Um, but hopefully you'll want to join. And that is it. Look at that, finished on time.